So we're happy to have with us today Eugene Shalgorodsky from King's College London, who will be giving our last seminar for this um, academic year, uh, talking about the essential norms of toplets operators. Please. Thank you. Thanks, Marco, for inviting me and for teaching me a very important lesson. Marco knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Right, so this is the first time I'm giving a uh, video talk, so I'm a little bit nervous. I obviously haven't done this before, so I'm not entirely sure how this is going to go. Um, right, I guess some people might have heard me talking about the same topic, so that there will be very little new for you, so, but you have a chance of switching, muting yourself and switching your camera off and doing something productive. You kind of will spiritually will be with us, but you won't waste too much time. Uh, now, and uh, perhaps a more important uh, warning is that if you are a hardcore Hilbert space person and you live in a Hilbert space, my talk is not for you. So all the questions that I will be discussing, they have trivial answers. In the case of L2, in the space of, in the case of Hilbert spaces, and that answer is usually one. Okay, so uh, oh, yes or one. So uh, everything, I mean, everything will be trivial for Hilbert spaces. Right. So let me first just remind you some notations. So if X and Y are Banach spaces, uh, B X Y stands for bounded linear operators. KXY stands for compact linear operators from X to Y. Uh, just to remind the notion of Fredholm operators, uh, well, kernel of an operator is just the set of vectors that are sent to zero, while the range is just a set of uh, values taken by the operator. And uh, the operator is called Fredholm if uh, the kernel is finite dimensional and the range is of finite core dimension. So basically, a Fredholm operator is not quite one to one. So the kernel is not trivial, but it's only finite dimensional. So it's kind of almost trivial. And uh, the operator is not onto but only finitely many dimensions are missing. So it does not cover the whole space, but up to finite dimension, it does. So it's kind of, as my sons would probably put it, it's a budget uh, invertible operator. It's not quite invertible, but this is second best uh, to being um, invertible. And the thing is that uh, many I mean, integral operators, be it singular or fret home, I mean, non-singular operators, they very often are not invertible, but are fretone. And uh, the notion, we will also need the notion of uh, a, um, the essential spectrum. So the usual spectrum is when A minus lambda identity is not invertible, uh, but uh, the operator might be invertible, oh, sorry, not invertible, but fretone. Right? In this case, lambda is in the spectrum, but it is not in the essential spectrum. If it is not Fredholm, then you have the essential spectrum. Lambda is in the essential spectrum, and uh, there are many reasons why we use this terminology, and one of those is that uh, the essential spectrum, unlike this spectrum, is uh, stable under compact perturbations. So you kind of think of compact uh, operators being inessential, you perturb the operator, the essential spectrum does not change. And this is the thing that people usually study, say, for integral operators, toplets operators in particular. Okay, now, uh, we have the notion of an essential norm. The essential norm is sometimes described as the distance of your operator to the set of compact operators. And I personally find this slightly counterintuitive. I mean, this is correct, of course, but for me, it's, um, so you're trying to find the norm of your operator. If you take this point of view that compact perturbations are inessential, then you can just perturb the operator, see what the norm of the perturb operator is. This is A minus K. 
and then you look what the in film is and then this kind of tells you what essentially what the norm is right so this is the essential norm of the operator and the essential norm plays i mean in the study of the essential spectra the essential norm plays the same role as the usual norm of the operator in the study of its spectrum and this is not uh, surprising because uh, if you just look at uh, the uh, quotient algebra of all bounded linear operators by the ideal of compact operators, this is very well known, Kalkin algebra. Now, uh, the invertibility in this, I mean, invertibility in this algebra is the same as being Fredholm, is as a Fredholm property. Uh, the essential spectrum of an operator is just this spectrum in this algebra, in Kalkin algebra, and the essential norm is the norm in Kalkin algebra. So it's kind of, uh, I guess, uh, all fits nicely together. And in particular, so the thing that I will uh, be using is that uh, the essential spectral radius is less than equal to the essential norm. So the spectral radius is the disk, is the radius of the smaller disk centered at zero that contains the spectrum. And we know that the spectral radius is less than or equal to the norm of the operator. All you need to do is to use as the word essential here. And you don't even need to produce a new proof because these notions, the essential no notions are the same as usual notions if you're thinking of the algebra, of Kalkin algebra. So the essential spectral radius is the radius the, of the smallest closed disk containing the essential spectrum. And it is less than or equal to the essential norm is exactly for the same reasons as we have when we are talking about the spectral radius and the norm without the word essential. Okay, so I will need this inequality. So this is kind of general uh, operator theory stuff. Now we uh, need to look at uh, Hardy spaces. Uh, well, you can think of Hardy space as uh, a space of functions on uh, the unit circle. It's a subspace of LP. Uh, you take uh, the Fourier series of uh, function F in LP. If all Fourier coefficients with negative indices are zero, then your function is in the Hardy space. Okay, and the, the norm there is just the LP norm. Now the reason, uh, I mean, th there is another way to understand Hardy space is you see any function like this because it doesn't have terms with N negative. It allows, it, it has an analytic extension inside unit disk. Okay, and you can think of the Hardy space as a space of boundary values of those functions that are analytic inside unit disk. I don't think I will use this uh, too often in this talk, but just, just to kind of remind you. Well, we have a subspace of LP, we have a corresponding projection. So this is risk projection. And while it is bounded, if P is strictly between one and infinity. And what it does, it takes the Fourier series of uh, the function and then chops off the part with negative N. And you obviously find yourself in the Hardy space. The boundedness of this uh, operator is not trivial, but it's a classical result due to risk. Now, the Toplitz operator. So let's probably maybe look at this thing. So the Toplitz operator is an operator acting on a Hardy space. So it has a like symbol or coefficient if like a, it's a function in L infinity. And what you do is the following. So you need to, to apply operator to any function in the Hardy space. So you take a function, you simply multiply it by a. Now, because a is not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have an analytic extension into unit disk, so this function AF is no longer in the Hardy space. And then you project it by risk projection into your 
hard disk space. So th this is the, um, I mean, this is the definition of topless operator. I mean, topless operators are really very, very important operators for a variety of reasons. I mean, it's a very simple operator. It's just like multiplication by function, but it's a non-trivial one. You just add to the, uh, the, a projection into the mix. So this is the topless operator. But they're related to the Riemann-Hilbert problem, to single integral operators, and to, to many things in elliptic PDEs, in two-dimensional case, and all of that. So these are really, really important operators. And my talk will be about the essential norms of those operators, of topless operators. So the first result uh, that I will uh, use here is that it is, well, I have to say that we are no way near to a good understanding of the essential spectrum of a topless operator if the coefficients are discontinuous, if the symbols are discontinuous. Uh, I mean, for piecewise continuous, we will have a good understanding, but beyond that, no. But what we do know is that the set of values of the symbol is always in the essential spectrum. Now we need to be a little bit careful about this symbol because our function A is from L infinity and L infinity functions are defined up to sets of measure zero, right? So uh, saying that your L infinity function has a particular value at a particular point doesn't really make sense. So what we're talking about here are values taken by the function that are invariant under changes of your function on sets of measure zero. Uh, you can have a definition of this in terms of a proper definition of essential values in terms of measure theory, but perhaps this is easier to understand for most people. So uh, lambda is an essential value of a function if and only if one over a minus lambda is not in L infinity. Okay, so this is, uh, Say, I mean, what I'm trying to say, I guess, here is that imagine you have a function identically equal to one, right? And then you take one point and change your function from one to two. No, one is the essential value and two is not. Okay, sort of, I'm trying to avoid this stuff. So anyway, so from these pictures, we know that the set of values taken by a function is in the essential spectrum. This means that set of values uh, if, you, if you take the L infinity norm of a function, this is the supremum of the moduli of points in this set, right? So they are, this is a subset of the essential spectrum. So therefore, L infinity norm will be less than or equal to the essential spectral radius, and it will be less than or equal to the essential norm of the operator because the spectral radius is less than the norm. The essential spectral radius is less than essential norm, less than or equal to. So this is a very simple estimate. So this is a lower estimate for the essential norm. Now how about the upper estimate, an upper estimate? Well, first of all, I mean, you can do the following simple estimate. So first of all, you, I mean, the essential norm is clearly less than or equal to the norm because the essential norm is infimum when you take all, all subtract all compact operators. Well, if your operator is just zero, that you are, norm is one of those things that participate in that infimum. So this is trivial. Now, uh, the equality is just the definition of the toplitz operator. And then this inequality is simply that uh, the norm of the of a product is less than or equal to the product of the norms. So you can see that in this estimate, we lose twice. First, we lose here. Oops. I didn't mean this. So first you, uh, you lose here, you go from the essential norm to the norm, potentially you, um, they might, they, these two numbers might be very, very different. And then this is also a very crude estimate. You are estimating the product uh, of, uh, I mean, norm of the product by the product of the norm. So there are two points here where you are losing something. So uh, yeah, so you, so in the right-hand side, you have this norm of uh, the risk projection. So what is this norm? The norm is known. It's one over sine of pi over p. 
But it's surprising that uh, how recent this result is. It's 2000. And um, well, what is important for us, if you look at this formula and take P to infinity, now when P goes to infinity, you get sine of zero downstairs, so it's zero. This right-hand side goes to infinity. When P goes to one, you will have sine of pi downstairs, so this is still zero, that's infinity. And this is what one expects to have because we know that the risk projection is not bounded on L1 and it is not bounded on L infinity. Okay, so this is all good. Uh, well, there was a very famous result that most people in harmonic analysis knew for, <laughs> for a long time, a similar result. So for the Cauchy single integral operator, and that result is, was proved by Picharides in 1972. And it's kind of surprising that, uh, I mean, these two operators, the Cauchy integral operator and uh, the risk projection, they're kind of all, almost the same operator. Look at this formula in particular. So what you have is that the projection is just the identity plus the single integral operator, one. You have this factor one half, but uh, factors do not matter. They come out of norms, so they, they don't mm, complicate anything. So the thing is surprising that people knew the norm of S in 1972, and it took people 28 years to, to get the norm of identity plus S. And it's a completely, it's a different level of difficulty. So the result of Picaridis is not a simple proof, but this is something that of the level you can find in, sort of could have been in Zygmunt's trigonometric series. Now, the 2000 thing is just very, very complicated proof. I think this is one of the first proofs involving this Bellman function techniques, etc. It's a very, very difficult proof. Say, so I can understand Picaridis proof, I could not even, I, I have never tried to understand uh, uh, the proof for the risk projection. So uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make here, and it will be to some extent important to us, that if you know the norm of A, it doesn't mean that you know, you know the norm of identity plus or minus A. This may be, uh, problems of a completely different level of difficulty. Although obviously we have trivial estimates, if you, are no, if you don't care about uh, sharp constants, precise constants, then that's fine. Then there is, these problems are equivalent. But if you're interested in sharp constants, then there is a huge difference. Okay, so that's the message I wanted to sort of stress here. Anyway, so this is what we have now. Uh, the estimate for the essential norm. So from below, we have just L infinity norm of the symbol. And this is a uh, obviously optimal estimate. If you just take A to be a constant, you will see that both things are just uh, the modules of that constant. So this part is trivial. Now, uh, the, the right uh, inequality seems like a non-optimal because remember when I uh, was justifying this inequality, right? So I told you that in the, those estimates, we, did, we had two steps where we are potentially losing something. So one might not expect this to be sharp, but you can look at the following example. Now this function A0 is a piecewise constant function. So say if you take case say, with a plus here, so theta is from zero to pi, we're talking about upper, the upper semicircle. On that semicircle, your function is this constant, sine of pi over p plus i, so cosine of, so obviously this constant has modulus one, and you have complex conjugate of that constant on the lower, semicircle. And so you have piecewise constant function takes just two values that are complex conjugates of each other, modulus one. But then uh, we, there is a well-developed theory, Fretton theory of tuplet surface with piecewise continuous symbols, in particular piecewise uh, constant symbols. And you can, from that theory, you can see that this uh, number one of a sign 
actually is in the essential spectrum. So because it is in, is in, in the essential spectrum, you have that uh, the essential norm of the operator is at least this constant. And again, A0 has L infinity norm equal to one. So the constant this, this constant, sine, one was sine, it's actually an optimal constant. So this inequality, two-sided inequality is optimal. So basically this sounds like, that's it. We have a complete and final answer. You cannot improve the left-hand side. You cannot improve the right inequality either. If you're talking about all uh, L infinity symbols, that's it. End of story. Now, Eugene, yes. Sorry, can I ask a question? Um, th th this equality, sorry, th this thing you've got in the middle, that one over sine of yeah. pi over p is in the essential spectrum of t of a naught. Yes. Um, um, I, I mean, is is there a kind of easy way to say to to see that because it's not one of the I mean, it seems that it's not one of the essential values of no. the function. But this anymore. is a very good point, uh, Mark. This is a general result that says that the essential spectrum is connected. So imagine you have a piecewise, imagine just a uh, graph, not graph, I mean, you, on the plane, you have this, you, you have a, cont I mean, what, think you are tracing the, uh, Contour given defined by your symbol. Symbol is complex value, right? So if it's piecewise continuous, you trace a continuous curve until you come to a discontinuity and then you jump. And then you continue, continue a continuous curve, right? So this is what the set of values of your symbol is. Now Goldberg and Krupnik tell you where you have a jump, you need to add to your essential spectrum a circular arc. And the circular arc is P dependent. In de it depends on P. And the numbers, you, it's a very good question. The numbers here are chosen in such a way that if you fit, so there's complex conjugate. If you put the circular arc that is given by goldberg krupnik theory, it crosses the real line exactly at this point. Thanks. So, and this is actually, you anticipated I mean, essentially anticipated, non-trivially anticipated. The, my next slide is that you see here, the essential spectrum depends on P. And the essential norm also depends on P. Now, my talk is not about the general case of L infinity discontinuous symbols. Yeah, by the way, yeah, this is an important line. Remember I told you that uh, for P equals two, pointless. Look at this inequality. If you put uh, p equals 2 here, you have sine of pi over 2. That's 1. So you have just equality. So the essential norm of any Toeplitz operator with L infinity symbol is just L infinity norm of the symbol. In L2, it's all simple. Okay. Now I'm moving to uh, continuous. So my talk is not about the general symbols. It's about continuous symbols. Now, continuous symbols here, it's an old result by Goldberg, is that in this case, the essential spectrum does not depend on P. If it's continuous, you have just one loop, and this is, uh, I mean, maybe self-intersecting, you, you not loop, I mean, you have a contour for this, the set of values of this, and uh, that's, uh, that's your essential spectrum. And then the spectrum depends on the winding number. I mean, you, you, you go into complement of the essential spectrum, open sets there, and you look at the winding number of, of uh, your curve around your point there. And if it's zero, then you are not in the spectrum. If it is not zero, then you are in the spectrum, etc. So, but the key point here for me is that the essential spectrum is P independent and it's just the set of values. Now, it's kind of natural to ask, is the essential norm, does the essential norm depend on P? So if you have a continuous, it's kind of natural to expect that because the norm, the essential norm is related to the essential spectrum, the essential spectrum is not, 
dependent and does not depend on p maybe the the essential norm does not depend on pi either so if it does not then it is the same as for l2 and for l2 we know that this is exactly the l infinity norm so the question posed by Bircher, Krupnik, and Zilberman in 1988 was, do we have this equality? And, uh, well, one piece of notation that I would ask you to remember is just E, e uh, sub M. These are just exponential functions. I mean, I wrote this for any complex number, but if you're on the unit circle, this is E to the power I M theta, right? So, I will use those functions. And in the same paper, Bircher, Krupnik, and Zilvan proved a very beautiful result that uh, this equality for uh, essential norm equals the L infinity norm of the symbol is uh, true for all continuous functions, even more than continuous function. You can even take functions that are sums of continuous functions and boundary values of bounded analytic functions. Now, bounded analytic functions can be heavily discontinuous. You can have, say, Blaschke product that has zeros accumulating to everything on the unit circle, for example. So your function will be discontinuous everywhere at every point, and it will be very, very discontinuous. So even for those functions, I'm, I, I'm mostly interested in continuous functions, but even for those functions, you don't need to check this for all of them. You just need to check it for one function one this is one over z basically or e to the power minus i theta you need to check this for just one symbol well obviously the l infinity norm of this is one so all you need to do is to prove that or disprove that this norm is one and you know is it just one operator it's a simple simple operator and it intuitively very appealing i mean it's kind of easy to believe that this is true and let me give you an argument why uh, why it is plausible just think of what this operator actually does this operator what is this operator so you take a function from hp from hardy space so it has this you can think of this as a free series if you're on unit circle or you can think of this a taylor series if you are in the unit this so this is the series now then you multiply by this symbol it's just multiplication by one over z. All the powers are reduced by one. That's all this operator, I mean, multiplication does. Now, we are no longer, I mean, this function is no longer in the Hardy space because we have this negative power, the term in red. So all the topless operator does is just cuts off this term, that's it. So this is what our operator does. It cuts off the first term, and then reduces uh, all powers by just one. It's a very simple operator. And the trivial observation is that if A naught, this coefficient is not there, if it's zero, right? So if this operator is zero, and zero is the zeros for the coefficient, or if you think of type of analytic function, this is just value of you know, analytic function at zero, or it's just the mean value of a function, this is integral. So if A naught is zero, then actually you are not cutting off anything. You are simply multiplying. And you are multiplying by a union modular function. So not only the norm of your operator on this subspace is one, it actually doesn't change the modulus of your function point-wise, never mind, never mind the norm. It just doesn't change the modulus of your function. And this happens on a subspace of codimension one. You have just one linear condition, the coefficient should be zero, and on almost the whole space, your operator is an isometry. So it's kind of natural, and who cares about one, di one dimension, right? So we have one dimensional subspace, I mean, on which something goes wrong, so to speak, right? We kind of cut it off, find a trunk operator, if you like. Essential norms are stable under compact perturbation, so they're stable under rank one perturbations. Surely this should be true. Well, is it? Now, the answer is here. So it turns out that the essential norm of this operator equals its norm. Okay? And this is 
in this answers that question the negative because it is known that the norm is actually larger than one for any p different from two. So again, the same paper by Birchard, Rubin, and Silberman, they prove that this norm is always greater than one unless p is two. So the answer to the equation is negative. Now, this essential norm does not, in general, equal the L infinity norm of the symbol. Now, you still want to have an upper estimate. So the lower estimate is L infinity norm is the, a lower estimate. You still want to have an upper estimate. The upper estimate that we have for L infinity symbols had a constant that exploded for P close to one and infinity. So that was an optimal estimate for the class of L infinity symbols. You want to have something uh, for symbols that are continuous where the constant does not explode when you go to one or infinity. You, you want to have a better upper estimate. And indeed such an estimate is true. And you have this estimate that uh, actually the essential norm is estimated by this power of two. Well, in particular, you can always estimate just, just by two. So the norm, the essential norm of a top, top list operator is always less than or equal to twice the L infinity norm. And this is true for all continuous symbols, even for continuous plus H infinity. So these are two main results of my talk. And this is basically uh, what this talk, talk is about. The rest, I will try to explain, uh, give you an idea of the proof of this and talk about some uh, open problems here. Okay, now, uh, one of the things is that uh, uh, it is very often surprisingly difficult to uh, find the essential norm of an operator. You know, in spectral analysis, we know that uh, the spectral, uh, the essential spectrum is usually much easier to find than the spectrum. I mean, the, say for in elliptic problems, very often you know the essential spectrum analytically. I mean, and to find the eigenvalues, you need to do all sorts of, uh, in most cases, you can't find them and you only can do this numerically. In many elliptic problems, the essential spectrum is actually easy to find. What is counterintuitive here is that the essential norm is very often in practice, very difficult to find. You know, finding the norm, norm of an operator is often a very difficult task. But here you are not just finding the norm of one operator, you need somehow to find the infimum of all perturbations by compact operators. And this normal is quite surprisingly difficult. So because of that, people use things that are called measures of non-compactness. So, uh, let me show you how, and basically both results, theorem one and two, they use measures of non-compactness to, uh, their proofs use measures of non-compactness, and I need two measures of non-compactness, and they're exactly those that, um, that are used in those proofs. So, first of all, so let me talk about uh, the Hausdorff measure of non-compactness of a set. Now, let me start from compact sets, or rather relatively compact sets. So com sets with compact closures. So we know that a set is relatively compact, or has compact closure, if and only if, for any epsilon, it can be covered by a finite set of open balls of radius epsilon. For any epsilon, you can find epsilon net. So this is uh, sort of an equivalent definition of compactness in metric spaces relative compactness, right? Now, suppose your set is not compact, not relatively compact, then you will not be able to cover your set by finitely many balls of arbitrarily small radius. Well, you can find it, I mean, you can always find a big ball if you take twice the, dia I mean, if you take uh, the, the ball that has uh, as radius, the diameter of your set, then you can obviously, cover your set with one big ball, fine. But now you want to see, can you go smaller, smaller, smaller? You cannot go to zero if your set is not uh, relatively compact. You cannot cover it by 
poles of arbitrarily small radius. But so there will be a constant that is the infimum of those radii with which you can cover your set by finitely many uh, balls. So, and this is called the measure of uh, the Hausdorff measure of non compactness. So, this is this Hausdorff measure of non compactness of a set. Now, when you have this notion, you can uh, define the measure of non compactness of an operator. Now, an operator is compact when the image of the unit ball is compact, relatively compact, right? So suppose your operator is not compact. So this means that this set is not relatively compact. So then it's natural to look at its measure of non-compactness. So it tells you how non-compact the image of the unit ball is. It tells you how non-compact your operator is. Okay, so this is the measure of non-compactness. Another measure of non-compactness is perhaps uh, easier to understand. It's very intuitive. Say, suppose you take a uh, you you take a closed linear subspace of X of finite co-dimension. Okay, so almost the whole space up to finite finitely many dimensions. So subspace of finite co-dimension. You restrict the operator. You restrict the operator to this subspace. And take the norm. So this is the operator from x from m to y, say, right? So take the norm. Well, in general, the norm will might be slightly smaller, say, than the norm of a. So you take the infimum. So this, I think, uh, intuitively, it's a very clear idea. You are sort of saying that what the operator does on finitely dimensional subspaces is irrelevant. And it sort of fits very nicely with the idea that uh, the essential norm is what you get by perturbing the operator by compact or finite rank operators, okay? So I think this is a very intuitive thing. So we have these two measures of non-compactness and they are equivalent. So there is uh, this two-sided inequality in the paper by Lebov and Schechter. And there's a typo there, I think these two, the this two is missing there. Yeah, these two, but the proof is correct. So uh, they have the, the, they prove this inequality. And also uh, both measures of non-compactness, they provide a lower estimate for the essential norm. Actually, this one half and two in this first inequality, they're optimal. One can prove that these are the best uh, estimate, uh, uh, best constants. Now, we have very nice lower estimates for the essential norm. Ideally, you would also want to have an upper estimate. You see, in my second theorem, I wanted to have an upper estimate for the essential norm. I told you that I will be, for the essential norm of the triplet operator, I told you that I will be talking about, uh, I will be using uh, measures of non-compactness. At the moment, I only have lower estimates. And in general, you do not expect upper estimates. So you cannot estimate the essential norm by measures of non-compactness unless you know something about the geometry of your space. And this is where we need a little bit of geometry of Banach spaces. These are so-called approximation properties of Banach spaces. And this is the space that is a bounded compact approximation property. So let me kind of take you slowly through this. Uh, things. So let me start from the end. I mean, somehow I always uh, <laughs> start from the end. So you have a, you have, suppose you have a finite set in your space, okay? So you want to approximate the identity operator there or by a compact operator on a finite set. Well, it's very easily done. You can just take, you have finitely many elements in F. Think of the subspace spanned by those. This is a finite dimensional subspace. There is always a projection onto this finite dimensional subspace. And on, you can take ST that projection. Then this left hand side is simply zero. Okay, you can make it as small as you like. But you don't have control over the norm of this projection. So as f increases, you take more and more points in your f, the dimension of a subspace increases and you, you lose control of 
the norm of your operator. So the approximation property tells you that you can have a uniform control. So that for any finite set, F, and any epsilon, you can satisfy this inequality in such a way by, by compact operator, but in such a way that you have uniform control of the norm of your operator. So this M is a uniform constant. You start with, there exists such an M, then everything else happens. So this M characterizes the geometry of a space. Now, uh, this is highlighted in red for the following reason. Uh, people who do this for the sake of geometry banner or geometry of banner spaces, they usually have just the norm of T there. People who apply it to measures of non-compactness have identity minus T. If you are not worried about uh, exact constants, those are equivalent. If you are and I am, this is the correct definition for us because this is uh, that appears in the estimates. So remember the point that I made earlier that you knowing the norm of t and norm, it's not the same as knowing the norm of identity minus t. So if you want to have sharp constant, it matters that this inequality in red is for identity minus t rather than for t. So this is the inequality, so this is a property of a Banach space. I need to have a, I will also need a sort of dual property here. Now the terminology here, dual compact approximation property is not commonly used, uh, but it doesn't matter, I mean, it's just convenient for me. The idea here is that now you're looking at a similar problem, but in the dual space. The finite set is in the dual space. What you are saying is almost, almost the same property as above, but for the dual space, but not quite. You see the same property, bound, bounded compact approximation property for Y star would be the existence of a compact operator on this space. Here we are trying, we are, we are asking for something more. This is not just any, this is, this is not just any compact operator on Y star. It has to be the adjoint operator of a compact operator on the original space. Okay, so it's, so the difference between the bounded compact approximation property by, for the dual space and this property is what we have here in the inequality the highlighted one. It's not an arbitrary compact operator on Y star as we would have had in the bounded compact approximation property for Y star. It's the, this is the adjoint of a compact operator, okay? So from here you can see, yeah, and so, well, the smallest, the, sh the best possible constants, I will denote by M Y and M star Y, or I will talking in some cases X, I think the next page I have space X doesn't matter. So it's easy to say, kind of explained already, that saying that X has a dual compact approximation property is stronger than saying that X star has bounded compact approximation property. Because in the latter, we take any compact operator on X star, in the former, we have the adjoint of compact operator, which is a compact operator, but maybe not an arbitrary compact operator. And obviously you have this estimate from, from there, from by the same logic you have the just obvious estimate for those constants. Now, I apologize, this might be an overkill because I will only do deal with uh, reflexive spaces. My spaces are LP or HP spaces. P is strictly between one and infinity. My spaces will be uh, reflexive. For reflexive spaces, there is no difference between those two properties. So X having dual compact approximation property or X star having bounded compact approximation property. There's no difference because every compact operator is uh, a joint of a compact operator. Just take the second adjoint that will be the original operator. So it's kind of this one is for, and this is all I need, but since, I mean, 
when you start doing stuff, then you can just kind of try to see how it's, it, it is in a more sort of general case. And it's interesting uh, that actually uh, for a space to have dual compact approximation property, this is strictly stronger than just having bounded compact operator. I'm not comparing now to X star. I'm not talking about dual compact approximation property of X and bounded compact approximation property of X, this, the same space, no dual space is involved. Well, Samuel proved that the dual compact approximation property is stronger and gave an example where you don't have the reverse implications. So just kind of interesting uh, questions that I don't know the answers to is uh, that, is there a space where, well, the implication in the first line and second line cannot be reversed. Can you have a situation where the adjoint, I mean the dual space has bounded compact approximation property, but the original does not have dual compact approximation. This is unknown. And also unknown is whether these constants can be different. But as I said, this is tangential uh, for us today because we, are, we will not be talking about uh, non-reflexive spaces. Okay, so, uh, and so why do we need those approximation properties? Well, label of instructors showed that the essential norm can be estimated by, by Hausdorff measure of non-compactness with this constant. Now, because we, I need an estimate with uh, this measure of non-compactness, and remember Hausdorff measure of non-compactness, and this highlighted one, they're comparable, and the constant is two. So you get this estimate with this constant two, and I just want to get rid of this. This is why I needed the dual property. So I want to get rid of this two, and, uh, but one can actually ask, I mean, is maybe we're all complicating the matter. I mean, this constant there, is it a sharp constant here? And if you look at the proof, it just kind of, it doesn't look like you're proving a sharp estimate. Surprisingly, surprisingly, it is a sharp estimate. So uh, in uh, Astala and Tilly, they proved that, I mean, it's sharp in the class of space. It's not sharp for any operator, but if you have an estimate, this estimate, with some constant, but this happens for every operator, non-compact operator, and for every banner space X, the source space, then the target space just has to have the bounded compact approximation and the constant M is actually cannot be smaller. So this NY is the correct constant. So basically, if you want to have an estimate like we do for any Banach space in any situation, then you, can, you cannot go better than that uh, um, estimate in the first display formula. It's a sharp constant one. I mean, obviously you may have situations where you can do something better, but in general, this is the right estimate. So as I said, I wanted to get rid of this red two, and this is why we need uh, the dual compact approximation property. And if you do have it, then the dual compact approximation property, I mean, you have this constant there. Again, is it a good estimate? Well, you can adopt the proof of Tilly and uh, Astal and Tilly. And actually, in a sense, this is a correct estimate because if you have this estimate, now uh, we are worried about the source space, not the target space. So if you have this for any non-compact operator and for any Banach space Y, then X has to have this dual compact approximation property. And this is the best constant you can hope for. So this is kind of, I mean, this is, uh, as I said, it's just uh, a reworking of the result by Tilian Astell. Now, and there is also sort of, you can feel that there's some sort of duality lurking beneath and there is a duality, it's again, interesting. The next page is not directly related to my talk, but again, I think it's very interesting. Turns out that these two measures of non-compactness, the house of one and the other one, they are related by this equality. So the M essential measure of non-compactness of A is the same as the house door 
measure of non-compactness of the joint operators, and there is some sort of self-duality property. So the, the measure of non-compactness of the dual operator is comparable to the measure of non-compactness of the original operator. And one half and two are optimal constants here. And somehow you can think that maybe that result that I showed you, you can just get by duality. And we know that the norm of the essential norm of the dual operator is less than or equal to the essential norm of the original operator. It's quite easy to prove. It follows from the, the, the fact that the norm, the norm of the dual operator is the same as the norm of the operator. And also that so you only need half of Schauder's theorem that the, dual, the adjoint of a compact operator is compact. This gives you immediately this estimate. What is surprising, really surprising, that the, op the, the, the opposite inequality is fundamentally untrue. So Tilly in 1995, uh, I mean, look, the first, the stuff about uh, measures of non-compactness, you can say, well, I'm not interested in this stuff. I mean, I mean, I, this is uh, esoteric stuff, I'm not interested. But the essential norms are not artificial creature, they're here. I mean, you, if you do operator theory, you very often deal with them, even unknowingly. And it's very surprising that you don't have uh, the dual property here. So, still constructed Banach spaces such that you cannot have uh, the opposite estimate, no matter which constant you choose. It's simply not comparable, these two. And this is a very surprising result, as I said. I, it has nothing to do with my talk, but I could not resist uh, mentioning here because it's very surprising and it's a very interesting result. Now, okay, so, right. So we will need to measure non-compactness uh, and we need uh, those uh, approximation constants. Now for HP, the approximation constants are given by this power of two, and this is where this power of two, you might remember in one of my theorems where I had this power, this is where it comes from, okay? Now, how does one prove this uh, theorem? I kind of started running out of time. I just flash uh, the idea of the proof at you. So basically what you, use, what you do, you use fair means of Fourier, Fourier sums. And for those, you know that they strongly converge to one in LP. You know that the norm of such an operator, the fair convolution is one. So the norm of this operator is always less than or equal to two. You know that for uh, L2, it's just one, and then you do interpolation. This is where this constant comes from. I don't know whether this is a sharp constant or not. I suspect that it isn't, okay? But this is a constant. Now, this is a theorem that we want to prove, right? So this is a theorem that we want to prove. And now with this machinery, the proof is trivial. It's surprisingly trivial. So first of all, we know now that we approximation constant for Hardy spaces is this. We know that the essential norm is estimated above by this measure of non-compactness times this constant. All we need to prove is that the essential, this measure of non-compactness is just L infinity norm of your operator. And now comes the reason why you need measures of non-compactness, because for this measure of non-compactness, the proof is trivial. First, you do the following. Suppose you have your, your symbol is just H infinity function times this e to the power minus two e sub minus n. Look, all it says is that suppose A has finitely many terms in the Fourier series with negative n. So it has n terms with negative indices, n terms. Now, for this, the proof is trivial because if you take a finite co-dimensional subspace of your Hardy space consisting of functions whose first n Fourier coefficients are zero. This is finite co-dimensional subspace. On that subspace, your toplitz operator is just multiplication by A. A has up to N terms with negative N. If you multiply by this, only the functions that have first N terms in their Fourier series equal to zero, you never get a negative power. You, then the, you are not, the projection does nothing. So therefore what you have is your operator reduces to multiplication. 
And that's it. That's the proof of this. And all you left to, to say is, look, uh, these functions are dense in C plus H infinity. That's it. That's a proof. The proof becomes trivial if you use this measure of non-compactness and uh, the density of functions with finitely many terms in the Fourier expansion with negative indices. That's it. That's a trivial proof. Now, uh, this is, uh, well, now you need to, to prove the lower estimate. Uh, I mean, this one. We know that the left-hand side is less than or equal to right-hand side. So you need the opposite estimate. And the opposite estimate we prove for another measure of non-compactness, which is even smaller than the essential norm. And the idea is quite simple. The idea is uh, simple. Uh, well, first one has, is not specific to topless operators for any operator. So there will be uh, a vector of unit norm such that uh, the norm of this is almost the norm of the operator. So you almost uh, sort of achieving the norm, right? So this is true for any operator. And then what you do, you take any finite set in HP. Think of those as the centers of the balls of small radius by which you want to cover the image of the unit ball. Think of those as centers. Now you can prove that if you compose your function with z to the power n to very high, n, very large n, then the distance to all of those guys will be almost the norm. So you cannot take the radii smaller than this norm minus two minus epsilon, because you, you have at least one function that will be at this distance from all of your finitely many points. Do you take any fin finitely many points? For them, you choose N capital, and then you have this inequality. So you cannot cover the image of the unit ball under your operator by finitely many small balls of the radius smaller than this highlighted constant, the finite epsilon. And that get, gets you uh, and uh, sort of lower estimate. A, and why this inequality is uh, true is form. First, you approximate those finitely many points by polynomials. And then you see what your function. So this is your function, Q. When you compose it with that to the power n, every power becomes power n, right? When you multiply by z to the power minus one, and then chop off the uh, one negative term, you get this. Now, if n is large, you have guys that have different powers from those polynomials there. In L2, they are orthogonal. In LP, there, there is no orthogonality, but they satisfy that inequality. So this is what you want to do. And look, let me flush it to you. I'm just one minute left, I think. Uh, open questions and uh, the, the most annoying open question here is we know that the norm of this operator is l larger than one for any any p different from two we don't know what it is <laughs> this is a very simple operator nobody knows what it is and uh, well we know that it is less than i mean the norm is the same as the norm of this operator. It's very easy to see. I mean, it's just subtracting basically the zero Fourier coefficient. Uh, the norm is less than or equal to LP. And for LP, we know the norm, but this is also very non-trivial. Unfortunately, I don't have time for this. We have this estimate, but uh, well, this for two, I mean, for if you are H infinity, it's two, it's known. If P is close to H infinity, you are close to two. But surprise comes that for, P close to one, it's not close to two. It's not kind of dual. For LP would have been dual. For HP, it is not, it's a surprise. I stop here and I explain this if you kind of ask me about this, but yeah, I stop here. And Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? So, so Eugene, uh, th th this is all f for tuplets operators. 
Um, uh, are there similar conjectures around, say, concerning Hankel operators? I mean, it's, uh, because see, Hankel you, operators, uh, unless you do stuff uh, with unbounded operators, Hankel operators they tend to be compact operators. So for them, um, you would not want to to talk about the essential norm that is zero, you would probably be talking about some sort of uh, um, SP numbers or sorts of uh, those classes. So, but this is, uh, yeah, something different. But I mean, I really find, look, there is a whole book on this backward shift operators, beautiful book, and they do it in HP spaces. I mean, it's absolutely, I love this book. But the norm, the norm, we don't know the norm of this operator in LP, I mean HP. In LP we know, but even this is a surprise. Do you know what the norm, of, do you know what this is? So kind of test, so this one. So the norm or in LP. So, so, so Eugene, are, are there, I, I mean, I'm guessing then that there are corresponding uh, uh, lacking knowledge about the, the, you know, the shift operators in the little LP spaces, right? No, in the little LP spaces, it's kind of easier because you're kind of, you have, you, your norm is easy. You, you kind of chop off something and I think it's just there for a little P is easy. But for, this is the answer for, LP. So think what you are doing. You take your function and you subtract uh, its average. So think you have, you have some interval 0, 1. You have a function in LP, you subtract is K0 is just the average. Function minus its average. You can't imagine how many people who are function, uh, sort of function spaces theory experts I asked. And no one knew the answer. Actually, and the story is very interesting. I mean, you can think of this probability from the probability theory point of view. In some function, you have a random variable, you subtract it expectation, and then you do the peace moment. This is centered moment. You want to estimate the centered moment by non-centered moment. Surely should, should be in Feller's uh, volume one or something like that. Well, to some extent, <laughs> True, this is, I mean, Mori proved this exactly in those terms. But what he didn't know, what the Franchetti did it for kind of with completely different community. Mori is probability theory. Franchetti was uh, function spaces. And he did it, but the proof was very, very complicated. Mori did a beautiful elementary proof, fantastic. And then Levitsky and Scripture, they knew about Franchetti, but they didn't know about Mori. It looks like analysts and probability theory people, they don't talk to each other that much. Well, I'm just looking at the list of attendees here and I don't see any of the probabilists from Cardiff uh, among the audience. So it looks as if you, you're probably right. Well, look, I, I know this for sure. You know, uh, now, uh, so now we're kind of confined to our homes, right? So if you're confined to your home, you might find yourself actually talking to the members of your family, right? And you might discover that they're actually very nice people. <laughs> and in, in, in my case, in my case, I discovered even more. You see, my wife and I, we went to university together, but she's uh, probability and statistics. We never collaborated in, in months, never. But somehow we started talking about this uh, centered moment and conditionally centered moment. And we ended up, so I simply didn't have time for, for this, but this is, Basically, so the approximation constant for LP, that, that CP constant that I showed you, Franchetti Mori constant. And uh, well, when you want to prove this, you need two sided, I mean, lower and upper estimates. And the upper estimate, you want to have an operator that actually does the job, approximate. And there's a conditional expectation operator constructed by, and this is how we sort of started collaborating on this. Yeah, yeah I mean, this is sort of, uh, yeah. I mean, this is the first time I see that probability is of direct relevance to, to I mean, what I do.
any more questions or comments from anyone? Well, I, I have one question, but it's not really a serious question. So, Jenny, of course, knows that the difference between probabilists and analysts is uh, what's, what is the relationship of, of P and Q. So, what is the relationship between P and Q and your uh, collaborative? <laughs> well, actually, yes. Yeah, so, learning for the sake of those who didn't attend past two stock, maybe you say this joke and then I uh, answer your question. Okay, so it's it's joke. I, I we both. Have heard from Pastor. So, what's the difference between analyst and probabilist? For pro probabilist, p plus q equals one, and for analyst, one over p plus one over q equals one. Okay. So, basically, for me, the surprising thing came, I mean, basically on this page. You see, these operators say identity minus, I mean, you take the function, subtract its average, right? So, on LP, LP and LQ, if you like, or LP prime. These are dual spaces. So in the normal, the joint is the same. So on LP, on LP prime, the norm, this norm is the same. And I was, I expected the same to be true for Hardy spaces. For Hardy space, the dual of HP is isomorphic to HP prime. And here we don't have this duality property. Something must be wrong, you think. Mm -hmm. But you see, for uh, LP spaces, the, the dual space is not just isomorphic, it's isometrically isomorphic to LP prime. And for Hardy spaces, it's only isomorphic, but it is not isometrically isomorphic to a HP prime. So because you don't have this isometric identification of the dual space mm -hmm. with HP prime, so you don't have uh, that the dual operator on this sort of HP prime rather than on the dual space has the same norm. And this is what kind of came as a surprise to me, but well, if you think about it, you understand what happens here. So at the left end, P equals to one. You don't have the same norm at the, at the right end, the P equals to infinity. And for LP, you do. These constants, uh, CP, they have this property. For LP, Everything as it should be. And for HP, it isn't, unfortunately. Any other questions? Okay, if not, then let's uh, thank Eugene again.